So let's dig in a little bit into what we understand is a, a healthy microbiome composition, what's unhealthy. Uh, so how do we know what a healthy microbiome is versus an, an, an unhealthy or industrialized, I've heard you use that term, an un- industrialized microbiome? What's the, the difference between them? Yeah, I, you know, the this question of a healthy microbiome is a million dollar question, and we can talk about it in, in different respects, because I think context matters so much, like who are we talking about with it, because there's no single healthy microbiome, uh, different microbiomes will um, be you know, health promoting in different people, different populations, different, even within a person, different periods of their life, uh, maybe a different microbiome that's really optimal. And so it's a really complex question. I think the, um, you know, the, uh, you know, to go, to go back to that human microbiome project, the, one of the major goals of, you know, uh, this field opening up was really to try to identify what a healthy microbiome is. And the, um, the approach, which seems really logical, is to study the microbiome of a bunch of healthy people and just try to distill out the commonalities. And I think, um, you know, and that's that's worked to some degree. I think we have a, a good understanding of what a microbiome looks like in a healthy, for instance, American. But the question is still, is that really a healthy microbiome? Um, I think that, you know, there we have kind of... Uh, a new or different frame of reference with a whole set of studies performed by various groups around the world, looking at populations of people that live traditional lifestyles. So hunter gatherers, rural agricultural populations, indigenous communities that haven't um, fully industrialized. And um, what is apparent from these studies is that uh, the microbiome of, of people that haven't been exposed to an industrialized lifestyle looks very different than the typical industrialized microbiome. And it leads to this possibility that through lifestyle change associated with urbanization, things like antibiotics, Western, all sorts of aspects of the Western diet, processed food, um, increased sanitation, you know, a lot of things that I would say probably have benefit to um, in, in, in different ways, you know, antibiotics, of course, wonderful drugs saved a, a bunch of lives, um, but also have all this collateral damage associated with them. Um, and, you know, a lot of the aspects of industrialized lifestyle are like that pluses and minuses, but, um, it appears that, that aspects of the industrialized lifestyle have changed our microbiome over a fairly short period of time for those of us living in the industrialized world. And it brings up this question of, you know, going back to, trying to document what a healthy microbiome looks like. If you document the microbiome of healthy industrialized populations, you may be documenting actually a perturbed microbiota that's predisposing people in that population to different inflammatory chronic diseases. And um, it doesn't mean that the hunter-gatherer microbiome is the optimal microbiome. And that's the one that's going to give us, I mean, you know, of course there are differences in lifespans in these different populations, but it's clear that there's less inflammatory disease and there's probably aspects of um, the microbiome pre-industrialization or that's present in these um, tradition populations living traditional lifestyles that are um you know, basically have become components of human biology, our microbial biology, and then been lost during industrialization that represent important aspects of our biology that we need to study and understand and potentially even bring back to um, to confer functions back on us that, that we've lost. So, so that's one way of thinking about the healthy microbiome. There's also this aspect of um, just kind of d- general diversity, which is an interesting aspect too. That this kind of goes back to one of the earlier questions you had of, of just this discussion of like growing up and thinking about bacteria as being bad. And if you look at a lot of what we did to expand lifespan in industrialized countries, it's things to remove bacteria, right? Antibiotics, sanitation, these kinds of things really improve lifespan because it got rid of bad microbes, but at the same time, it also got rid of good microbes too. And so while, you know, nobody wants to go back to a pre-antibiotic world or a world where we don't have access to clean water, 
Now, because of the what we know about the microbiome, we understand that in getting rid of bad microbes, we probably also got rid of good microbes, mm. you know, good bacteria that we were consuming along with our food and water that was less sanitized, you know, a hundred years ago. And that has resulted in a decline in the diversity of bacteria, the different types of bacteria that we house within our guts. And in general, it looks like when you have a low diversity microbiota, you have in general poorer health. And so the question becomes, how do we maintain this lifestyle where we're not exposed to germs, pathogens, bad microbes, but are still in contact with the good bacteria that can help grow our microbiome diversity and improve our health? It's a very interesting uh, thing to ponder. How do we balance the, yeah, the exactly. good parts of the modern industrialized world mm-hmm. and and still try and maintain this diversity and and restore or bring back some of these microbes that perhaps we've we've lost? You mentioned the the mucosal layer earlier. Can we go a little bit into that? I'm I'm interested. Is it as we lose diversity? that the mucosal layer begins to become affected or is this just something that also happens uh, as part of a diet that is low in fiber and, and rich in ultra processed foods? Yeah, it's, um, it's a good question. You know, that, um, so the muc- so just to give some background here, we of course have, you know, this dense microbial community living in our digestive tract. And then we have, um, our col- colonic or intestinal epithelium, the layer of, of cells that sit right at the interface of um, the gut, um, very close to this incredibly dense community of microbes. And so um, our cells secrete this mucus layer, which helps keep the microbes at kind of a, a little bit of a distance. It serves as a buffer space, the kind of good fences make good neighbors sort of approach to maintaining uh, harmony in the gut. And, um, and, that mucus layer is composed of carbohydrates. Um, it's just what what we make and secrete to you know serve as this kind of gummy gummy substance to to keep microbes away. But um, many microbes in the gut have also adapted to be able to both attach to that mucus layer and to eat it. You know, many of the microbes are really good at eating dietary fiber, the complex carbohydrates in our diet. Um, some of those microbes have um, alternatively specialized or have the additional capability of utilizing mucus carbohydrates. Um, some of them as a backup food source. So if dietary substrates, we were talking about fasting before, um, during fast, we know that a lot of the mucus utilizers become very abundant in the gut because mucus is continuously produced by the host and it serves as this kind of consistent endogenous source of calories for the microbes. Um, and we know that if we deprive of dietary fiber, at least in animal models, um, we begin to see an enrichment of those mucus utilizing microbes in the gut. And we begin to see the mucus layer thin. It actually becomes um, uh, depleted and the microbes appear to move closer to the host tissue. And in doing that, um, start to incite markers of inflammation. And so at least in animal models, it appears that a low fiber diet can lead to depletion of this mucus layer um, and, you know, these are studies that have been done over short periods of time, like a month or something like that. You start to see these markers of inflammation come on. And it leads to this question of what happens in a society where you have undergone, you know, a, a huge reduction in dietary fiber consumption and, um, you know, have an entire population over generations eating low fiber diets. Um, you know, could this mean, could, could this be part of the explanation for why, uh, for instance, um, inflammatory bowel disease rates are going up at a pretty tremendous rate in industrialized countries. 